This is The Resilient Life, where we believe that every human will struggle in this life. Our challenge is to struggle well. I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war, my mom to cancer, and I'm the daughter of a retired Marine. I'm also a wife, mom, author, and president of one of the nation's leading veteran service organizations. Join me and some incredible guests as we explore the value of struggling well through life's inevitable challenges. Cool. All right. Welcome to another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. I'm super excited to be joined today by retired NFL defensive end, two-time Super Bowl winner, Chris Long, founder of the Chris Long Foundation. Chris, welcome to the Resilient Life Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really uh, honored to be here. I'm, um, I got to start off with uh, the Super Bowl because I'm a Philly girl, uh, you know, season ticket holder to the Eagles for many, many years. Um, and I still can, I just get giddy when I think about the, the Eagles Super Bowl win. Um, it was the most incredible time for the city. Uh, my husband went to every game. He was at the NFL champ- or the NFC championship game. And when they won, when you guys won, he said, I'm going to the Super Bowl. I don't know how I'm going to figure it out. I have to, so, if you go and, that far. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and he ended up going out there and watching you guys win. And we were here back in Doylestown and had a huge party. Um, my dad pulled out a bottle of Dom that was from like 1997. And he had just been oh, holding man. on to it. Like, I don't know when we're going to drink this, but there's going <laughs> to, a time's going to come where it's going to be the right moment. And it was that night that we opened that bottle up and, it was just such an incredible time. And, and, you know, you think about it, like this one game brought the city together in such a big way. And it, it was from, you know, winning that NFC championship to the Super Bowl, to the parade, um, to the speeches that were happening on the steps of the art museum. I mean, all of it combined, uh, there was just a pulse to this city that I had never felt before. Uh, and I'd love to know from you again, you, you won a Super Bowl with the Patriots, but coming to Philly, I, I have to, I'm, I'm a bit biased, but I have to think that you felt something a little bit different about the Philly crowd. Absolutely. Um, number one, you, you know when it's time to bust out the 97 Dom. It's not yeah. like, <laughs> there's, you don't have to plan. It's just going to, when it happens, you'll know. And I think right. um, the only, if there's anything I was ever jealous of being on the field, it was the fans and their experience because it was just such an intense experience for Philly people. If you heard them really talk about it, if you're really listening to what they said and just the, the length of time that, you know, some people like your pops are probably waiting uh, to see a winner like that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, for that reason alone, I think, you know, when you join the Patriots and I cherished every moment of that run, because if it's not for the Patriots run, I don't have the house money in my brain to play with, to go take a chance, like play for the Eagles. So if I don't get, you know, if I played in St. Louis one year longer, I'd have never picked the Eagles. Um, because when I played in St. Louis, there were, it was eight years of losing. And when I had my first opportunity to hit the market um, in 2016, I wanted to win at all costs. So you, you handicap and you pick, and it came down to Atlanta and new England uh, <laughs> coincidentally. And I'm sitting there at halftime, like, oh, I made the wrong choice when we're down 28-3. <laughs> but, you know, just the way that magical year ended gave me the latitude to do what I wanted in free agency the next year. And I decided I want to leave New England. And um, yes, to your point, New England is a machine. Like, they've won, they've won Super Bowls. They, they, you know, this is what's expected. And I think what was so fun about Philly was like, listen – we're, nobody expects us to win anything. And, you know, I certainly didn't expect to win a Super Bowl when I signed with Philly. And if you talk to Torrey Smith or LeGarrette Blunt, it was more just an excitement about having fun and, and being able to make a run, maybe. Maybe make a run at the playoffs. Maybe, you know, but I was in it to, to, to get back to doing what I do and what I love to do schematically. And that was the Philly draw for me. And the city, obviously, was something that people raved about. So, That year was different. And yes, I mean, that year, you know, if if New England um, validated my career and made me feel like I wasn't a loser, you know, for having lost eight years, 
uh, Philly made my career validation and like making it. Um, I don't know if people are going to say those are two words that are too close together, but you know, I didn't cry after that New England Super Bowl. Um, it was more like a relief. And after the Philly Super Bowl, it was this release of like, all right, I'm good now. Like, I am happy with my career. Well, and I think, you know, it, it's funny because I was talking to my husband about the fact that I was going to be interviewing you and he was talking, you know, I mean, anytime he gets to talk about that, that time, you know, and, mm -hmm. and he was saying to me, you know, the, the, the magic of that Super Bowl from a fan's perspective is what was happening behind the scenes because it yeah. was this it was this team that was riddled with injury. You're going in with your second string quarterback. He said there was magic happening in that locker room because yeah. if there was not, like they would not have been able to accomplish. It was what they did. And so that was what was special from a fan perspective. And, yeah. and you know, clearly as when you think about it more than just being a game, there was leadership. There was leaders that had to step up and, and talk yeah. to me about like, who were the leaders on that team? Who were the people that were kind of taking it and saying like, after every, you know, when Wentz goes down, when, when people are being injured and, like, and you're still pounding it and you're still seeing hope yeah. and light at the end of the tum tunnel. Well, I think it's a great point. I mean, it was special in so many ways, like geographically for the fan base, the unlikely nature of us even being there. Um, if you talk to people before the season, but it was also special because of what transpired you know, weeks one through 16. I mean, our whole team was injured. Um, you know, and when you lose your MVP caliber quarterback, that's a death sentence in the NFL. Right. You know, backup quarterbacks don't often lead teams anywhere deep into the postseason, um, especially not when they're thrown into the, the fire late in the season. And we had a special backup quarterback. I mean, Nick Foles has been there, done that. I mean, he hasn't done that at that point, but He's he's been to high heights. He's set records in Philly. He's also seen the lows. And we were together in St. Louis. And he was not Nick Foles that you know in St. Louis. I mean, he was it was rock bottom for him. And actually, eventually, that turn of events led to him almost retiring in Kansas City. I mean, Nick Foles almost said the hell with it. And I don't blame him because I was there with him in St. Louis. So we had a special bond where we had seen that part of it as an aside. And so it was fun to like go through that with Nick too, because we had seen like, we'd sat in the hot tub in earth city, Missouri and lamented being two and whatever, or lamented him playing his worst ball, me hobbling around injured about to get cut. Like right. it was just crazy to look around and be in that situation. But certainly when Carson went down, Nick was a leader, you know, he had to show the poise. He had to show that like unflappable kind of vibe and that's contagious. I mean, that's leadership can also be just doesn't have to be what you say. It can be how you carry yourself. And I think Nick checked both of those boxes off. Carson was a leader in his own way. Carson got hurt, certainly could have pouted, been mad that like he doesn't get to go on this ride. And I know it hurt. I know he would have rather won it himself, but he stuck by the, the group and he never he never wavered and he showed up and he was enthusiastic. I mean, Malcolm, obviously, is the guy you see breaking the team down on the field. Uh, Malcolm's a leader, Brent Selleck, Jason Kelsey, um, Torrey Smith, LeGarrette Blunt, myself. I mean, we had so many guys that had been there, you know, maybe not there, but we'd seen it all collectively. And um, that was one of the biggest things. That team was made up of a lot of veteran leadership. And when, when the SHIT hits the fan, you want people that don't flinch so much. Um, and we had guys that weren't looking around, looking for people to lead them. We had guys leading um, the group, no questions asked. And we had guys that that were communicators and guys that built each other up. And that's what I think is a football team. And I, we were the perfect football team, in my opinion. I don't mean on the field. We really loved each other and we were empowered by the gravity of the situation in Philly. And uh, we were just like, nobody could... Nobody could touch us. We were, we had that vibe about us. Well, I think it was, again, you say you were the perfect football team, but, but perhaps you were the perfect team, right? And yeah. that's, what, that's what a team is all about, right? How you yeah. collectively come together, how you all step up. And, and I felt that. So um, uh, 
it was awesome to watch. It was palpable. It was palpable because you just, you'll never be, I'll never be a part of something like that again. Yeah. You know, and I, I was never a part of something like that before that. And uh, it's not to say I didn't have special groups in, you know, in St. Louis, the most special group I've ever been a part of was our D line, you know, in St. Louis. I mean, guys like, you know, uh, Aaron Donald, William Hayes, Robert Quinn, myself, you know, Kendall Langford, the list goes on. We were, I'll never get that back, you right. know? Um, so I'm not saying that, that everything about Philly was the best thing that ever happened to me from a team standpoint. I played with a lot of awesome dudes throughout my time in the league. I'm very lucky, but collectively as a team, we just have magic. We just have magic. And uh, you, you can't, you can't replicate that swagger we had. Well, we saw the swagger. I saw the swagger in the parade. I loved watching you in your fur jacket, your big sunglasses. It was my my husband, again, in true fashion, I watched it on TV from home. My husband was down there in the front <laughs> Good for him. with the kids, uh, like sending pictures at like six in the morning, set up in his post. But It was hot in that jacket, though. I mean, good Lord, it was cold <laughs> that day. But I was like, you know, it's one of those things, like if I could just get an in-between fake fur jacket, that would just be a little bit less... It was fake fur, by the way, for anybody that's not into that. But like, <laughs> but it was it was one of those things where you go outside in the morning, you're like, damn, am I gonna be warm enough? You put that jacket on, you're sweating the whole parade. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Well, it was an awesome day. And and clearly you've left an indel indelible mark on the NFL. You're one of only, I think, five or six people that have yeah, two, you know, two, Super two, Bowl two. rings from two two different teams. I mean, it's an awesome accomplishment. Your dad, you know, you come from a, a a dynasty your dad is howie long but mm -hmm. what i love more is the impact that you've made off the field and you know in 2018 you were named the walter payton our uh, walter payton man of the year you donated mm -hmm. your entire salary in 2017 to charitable causes and you really started getting involved in and sharing your opinion and commentary on social issues and you're not the first person athlete celebrity to stand right. up and speak out but I have to tell you that you do it in a way that makes people listen. And that's what I love. Um, everything you say, I may not agree with everything that you have put out there, but you bring it from a place of understanding where I can relate and understand what you're saying. And I think that's so important. And I don't know if that's intentional, but you know, it's, it's really hard when sometimes you see um celebrities or athletes on soapboxes and they're very outspoken yeah and i don't think they all I, i'm okay with anybody saying anything but there's a way to do it the right way and, and I, regular people too yeah, i mean like listen i think the biggest thing is as athletes as entertainers as people with platforms like we're not special for having the platforms but we have opinions and right. and we're entitled to them just like you know um you or, or or my my mom or my dad or well my dad i guess we're talking about again an athlete a celebrity but i like the guy down the street i mean you know when he has an opinion and we all have a, a piece of this pie where we all share in this thing that's america or our society or you know, the world, like we all care. Um, and if you have a political opinion or something that doesn't mesh with sports, I always got annoyed by the stick to sports thing because I don't tell the accountant to stick to accounting. I don't tell the garbage man to stick to, you know, picking up garbage. You can't have a piece of this civic duty, which is like, you know, giving a shit about, and I spelled out shit earlier. Can I say shit on this podcast? If I yes, can't, I'll just can. stop. I feel like you might have some cussers on this podcast. You're good. You're good. Okay. But like, I care. I mean, like, I can't help caring and um, I can't help my opinions. And I think, you know, I, my philosophy on how to share them has changed. It's gone up and down. Like I'll go back and forth on ways that I want to leverage my platform. But if I have any problem, it's always, I'll tell you exactly how I feel. I think most people that know me, you know, it's a gift and a curse. Like I will take the awkward air out of a situation and just say exactly what's going on in a group. And people are like, yo, that was unsettling because <laughs> you're not supposed to say that. Like we, it's the elephant in the room. Like I just, I just, um, I can get myself into trouble that way, but I do care. And that's the thing is like, um, you, you said it sometimes athletes or celebrities or people in general, um, will, 
talk about things and they don't put any sweat equity into it. And I've just always tried to, whatever I speak on, I have to organically really care about it. And I have to, um, I have to back it up with some action and we're not always going to agree. People aren't always going to agree with everything, but I do think it's important, you know, how you, how you talk about your convictions, like the way you talk about them thinking and putting yourself in other people's shoes. Um, and that includes people you disagree with. And I've struggled to do that at times. And that's no secret. I mean, I think I've been transparent about that. Um, but for the most part, I see my purpose if I am going to be talking about things. And a lot of times the elephant in the room is I'm a white guy talking about things that that don't always affect me. If I care about those things and I want other people to care about them, the point is to be able to bring people over or to speak to somebody who hasn't like thought of things the way I'm talking about them or for a white guy who looks like me to say oh that Chris Long he seems pretty reasonable he's not some like ridiculous guy that just says whatever um he cares about what he's talking about oh and he looks like me oh and he's like all these stereotypes of people that you know I, I think are just like me he's he does a lot of the same things I do he just has a we just get so caught up in these identity politics or identity you know ideologies and we're so afraid to like consider other people's perspectives and I think like if I can help in one way it's I'm the guy that looks like you you know talking to a white guy listening to this podcast and I'm not crazy right <laughs> I'm not radical I'm not crazy I just um I care about certain things. And so, and I'm also, I'll call, I'll, I'll call it how I see it. And sometimes, you know, I've gotten shit from my side of the fence on issues because I haven't agreed with something and I'm not afraid to say that either. And I also think that the equity I built up by being honest and, and stepping up at times gives me the latitude to do that because people that trust me um, can hear me when there's a self criticism when it comes to like hey we're like-minded we're not doing something right here or we're not considering something correctly we also have a real problem with how we discuss things the internet is awful um it's awful and i had a long spell as an athlete where i use my platform um imperfectly on twitter or any any like you know through through the media the problem is that's all you got as an athlete. Um, and people can take your words out of context. They can put it in big, bold letters on the score or bleacher report. They can take, they can, they can make you sound like you're saying something you're not. They can, the tone can read differently. And so I got really discouraged by the fact that not only were people twisting things out of context at times, but also if I was the only guy talking about something, because I, I don't, I'm not afraid, right. then I get to look like some hero and I'm not a hero. I, I'm not, I'm not a genius. I'm not a hero. I don't have all the answers. I just say what I think. And sometimes because that herd is pretty thin, I can look like self-important and that's never how I intend to come off. The great thing is in retirement, I have a podcast. So when I talk about things, you can hear my voice. You can hear, you can hear my tone. You hear the entire quote. I'll still get got sometimes, but I'm way more comfortable doing things on my terms um, in retirement than I was in, in, in when I played in the league because there was always that possibility that people were going to misunderstand you. I have no problem if somebody disagrees with me or calls me an asshole or calls me crazy, but you better understand exactly what I'm saying. That's my biggest pet peeve is like, and that can be really hard as an athlete. Yeah, well, I think about, you know, again, there's this idea of speaking out, which you have done. And listen, have you been criticized for it? Sure, of course. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't think you've ever gotten to a point because I, I try to look at this objectively, this idea of, you know, and let's just say athletes, right? We'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll just say athletes speaking out. You know, you've got the LeBron James that, that will say certain things. And, and then you, you have like the Drew Brees and mm -hmm. uh, you look at kind of what he went through mm -hmm. um, after speaking, kind of sharing his thoughts and opinions. And, and he was, you know, for better lack of a word, uh, I, it, he was, it, there was an attempt to cancel him because. Yeah. Uh, well, I would disagree canceled. on the cancel thing because okay. I don't think he, like he went out and made a bunch of money the next year. He's still on commercials. People still love him and his but teammates. He had to apologize. 
he had to apologize. apologize. And I think he, I, and we might not agree on this, but I do think he should have apologized. Okay. Because I don't disagree with his interpretation of the flag. Mm -hmm. Everybody deserves their own interpretation, including my black teammates, because their interpretation of the flag through their life experience must be very different. It's just like when we talk about police reform or something, I, I don't mean to go on like five different asides, but like, no. for example, if I think policing can be improved upon, that's a rarity in my neighborhood. I'm looking out my window. I don't see people cruising this block. You know, I, 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 you know, I, I don't see them pulling the kids in the suburbs here out for smoking pot or, you know, like harassing them in the car. That's my experience. Police were there to help me growing up because my neighborhoods are safer. There's not conflict. There's not crime. Um, I'm, pr I'm privileged to live here. And so like policing just looks different to somebody who grew up where they were in a neighborhood where they were at odds with the police or maybe the police didn't understand them and they didn't understand the police and so like it's the same thing with the flag to me like if I were a black American I would think very differently about the flag and I think where Drew made a mistake was he shared his perspective which I've done before mm -hmm. but what he did was then he he was instructive he was dismissive of the other one and he was kind of like you have th this is what you need to think is where I when I heard that and I love Drew and I think he's like a one dude and I also think people make mistakes so if anybody's like you know off of that we can never speak to Drew again I disagree there okay. like that's just ridiculous so yeah. on my podcast the way I said it was like Drew disappointed me just because he didn't think through what he said and it sounded like he was kind of he was kind of instructing people on how to think when you share your opinion it's one thing, but then when you say you need to think like me, which is what it sounded like to me, that's where I disagreed. That's fair enough. I, I, yeah, I just, you know, I look at, and again, I think with the NFL, the, the flag has become such this, you know, centralized issue. Um, yeah. And, and, and for me, I, I'll tell you personally, I've struggled with it. You know, I have a brother who, who died fighting yeah. for our country, you know, so the, the meaning of the flag is very different for me, you know, and yeah. what it represents for me. And, you know, and I, I at times have to put my personal feelings aside, you yeah. know, because there have been times and, and I'll be very, very open, like that I felt disrespected that anyone would kneel for the flag that my brother gave his life for, right? Like, And if it's anybody's right, it's your right. Right, right. And, and but, <laughs> but I also, you know, I'll tell you, I've also felt, um, I've also felt like I couldn't share that. I couldn't share that without people saying like, well, she doesn't get it. And it's not that I don't get it. Like yeah. I get it, but I still personally feel this way. I will always stand for the flag. And because it represents something very different for me. You know? Yeah. I mean, like, it's like when you talk to, uh, you know, one of my buddies, a Marine, who's like, well, when, when we f fly a casket back, I mean, that flag is draped. Yeah. over my buddy's casket and so again association is very different have you considered that and I think if you said it you're so eloquent and like understanding I can already tell just by like talking to you that like you do try to see things from that I think most people have a problem with the people that are like I feel disrespected and there's no other way that somebody could feel about you know what I mean like I think anybody that understands what you've been through and your association with the flag I mean, that's how you feel. And you've tried to understand a different perspective. I, I can tell. And so like, I, I just, the same way you feel about that flag, and I don't mean to sound radical here, but a black American might feel the opposite intensity, right. you know? And so I think what we're all trying to figure out is how can we improve this place? Cause it's what we got. And there are great things about America. And there are bad things about America. And I don't think when we when we criticize America, we're saying that everywhere else is perfect. Like the no, world is I, ugly. I mean, the world is dangerous. The world is, is you know, like. Right. I, just, I yeah. say that, you know, America with all its flaws was still uh, uh, the America that my brother and many others felt was worth fighting and giving their lives for. Right. Like we, yeah. are, we are not a, we are a flaw society. Yeah. But I think for me, it's important every day to to find common ground and understanding because those were the principles that these men and women fought and gave their lives. No for. doubt, like, it's no important, doubt, you know. But there are my teammates who say, "Totally got you, Drew Brees. Your dad fought in World War II, or your grandfather. He's not that old." Yeah. <laughs> but, but 
but Drew Brees' grandfather fought in World War II, and that's a great share. And like, that's why it's important to you. I get it. It's the reason I never knelt was because I work with too many veterans who have expressed this to me. And I still won't. Yeah. But at times when we had our last president, I felt like if Ameri- if if this is America, then maybe I should hit a knee. And it was really hard for me, you know, because but with Drew talking about um, his um, his grandfather, totally valid, man. But I got black teammates whose grandfathers fought in World War Two and came home and they didn't have rights. Right. And so there's just the perspective shifting like thing where it's like. Drew can feel how he feels totally. How many guys in the NFL before we got into this thing where I, I didn't agree with this thing, like where it was a litmus test for giving a shit because I never took a knee, but you can't tell me I've gotten death threats over, over, over putting my hand on Malcolm Jenkins shoulder right. from a veteran. Okay. So my thing is like, I take every situation individually. And I also realize the context around it is that like, this is very volatile Not everybody feels the same way about the flag, but nobody paid attention to guys talking about this until they, they, so as far as a, I got a question from somebody last summer, which I thought was really illuminating who disagreed, but we were having a civil conversation on the internet, which is rare. The dude was like, do you think Colin Kaepernick and listen, I'm not like, I think we, I care about the work. I don't like, so I'm not here to talk about Colin Kaepernick and he's done work and he's said things that have pissed people off. And I don't agree with everything he said, but when it comes to the act of a protest or something to draw attention to an issue, somebody asked me a question last summer. They said, do you, it was 11 o'clock at night. Do you really think that Colin Kaepernick picked the right time to, to uh, demonstrate during the anthem? And he's asking me about a question, of course, that's relevant in its origins in like 2016 or two so it's 2020 in the summer of 2020 the answer is in the question man you're still talking about it and so that's so to me like it's ugly like some of the ugliest growing we have to do as people in your relationships and in your family like in your country i just feel like there's some ugly times and we've been dealing with an ugly time but it's probably necessary a lot of the conversations we're having and, and all I'm saying is that some of my teammates push some of these really tough conversations to the forefront. Nobody would have listened if Colin was standing at his, at his locker. Yeah. That's the, so he, he picked this time that it would, and by the way, my buddy, Nate Boyer told him you should kneel. That's a little more respectful than sitting. And I would appreciate it. And Colin took his advice and said, no problem. Right. I don't want to be disrespectful. And I also have guys, teammates that were like, I got military members who are family members you know, uh, black, black dudes on my team that say like, Hey, my grandfather served. So I feel really conflicted, but I also know that like, if we're trying to get people's attention on some issues, Hey, you can't take that away. It got, that worked. And, and, and I will say, um, uh, listen, I did not agree with a lot of the things he said, but again, another person that I grew to respect, uh, was Malcolm. Because yeah. I, the way he came at things and the way he was able to articulate where he was coming from, I listened. And so for me, I, you know, um, and, and I've had disagreements with my family, with, you know, uncles of mine that are veterans that even me bringing that up, they couldn't see past it. They saw red. They, they couldn't even have that conversation with me. And I'm saying, listen, I don't agree, but I'm going to listen and I can find some sort of, a, and that, that was not even a place that they can get to. So I, and again, I'm, I'm not on here preaching to you. Like, no, like I know. listen, this is, it's having a conversation for the listeners because it's very rarely a part get... of what I was intending to go down this road. No, but I mean, it's, it, it, but it's an important conversation. I don't think enough people have conversations like this where we're like, Hey, like, and here's the irony. I bet you on a lot of the issues, you know, I, I know that if you're like a lot of the, the issues with mass incarceration or with some of the policing issues, I bet you that some of the things we'd find common ground on, it's just, we all fight over the flag thing. And, and my thing is like, I've seen a lot of people who are not veterans who are just plain racist, try to throw you guys under the bus as some I- ideological shield who all they do on Memorial Day is drink beer and wear American flag onesies, which I've done before. 
I mean, I, I got an American flag onesie and that sort of thing. They don't really give a shit. They haven't worked with veterans. They don't, they don't know the difference. I got guys that are telling me these guys are assholes who wish living veterans happy Memorial day. Yeah. Like I, so my thing is like the people who really have a right to, it stings a little bit for you. And I get that. I get that. When my buddies are on Conquering Killy, we have hard conversations. Like, it stings a little bit for me, but I'm listening. I appreciate that. It's amazing. It's amazing that you could look past a really deep hurt and an association um, and, and a pride in that flag to listen. And that's all, man. And I, I just, I think more people got to have conversations where they're just, where they lay it out and they don't scream at each other about it. Well, you know, there's some things I'll, I'll scream about people on. If you're a racist, you know, um, if 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 you're if you're a hypocrite or you're just not listening, like, you know, eventually we can't have a conversation. But I just love the fact that we can have this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's this misconception that um, that veterans are this group of like you said, there's this stigma that they're that they are one type of person where in fact, our, our military community is the most diverse group of people that exists in this country. They yeah. come from all different backgrounds, all different socioeconomic backgrounds, walks of life, ethnicities, and yeah. they all come together to achieve a common goal. So there's so much that we can learn from the men and women who serve. And You're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And that's why we bring them on Conquering Killy because they're leaders. They lead us. Like, yeah. you know, we we climb Kilimanjaro with veterans every every off season. And a lot of them are amputees or people that are overcoming like challenges and they kick ass and they lead us up the mountain. Like these these big, tough football dudes, like the veterans aren't there for charity. The veterans are there to lead and to be like mountain movers. So my respect for the veteran community runs deep and yeah. my respect for their service oriented mindset runs deep. Um, I just, you know, I never want people to think, and I think we're also really shitty at this in this country at this juncture is holding multiple, well, it's not even two holding two opposing thoughts at the same time. We've had this, like, we're just so divided that find me, I think people are like, wait, Chris Long supports guys who are kneeling and the ideologies that they're, that they're trying to discuss or like the issues they're bringing, but he climbs a mountain with veterans that a lot of people don't want to live in that world where you have to be able to, people are so tribal, right? You know, people are so tribal where they have to stick to their group. I don't need a group. I just, I, my whole thing is like, I just, I just like the truth and the truth to me um, always gets bogged down in these, in these battles where it's like, it sucks the flag thing has just become, and this is the biggest imperfection with the whole thing is that it's, it's at times. And a lot of people, not you, I'm not talking about you have been intentionally like missing the point, not yeah, you. Well, I'm not no, talking no, no. about veterans. Yeah. I'm talking about just random people, you know, and, and, and if you talk about Malcolm, when you heard him articulate what he's talking about, you're like, yes, dude, like a lot of the things you're talking about, I can, I can get down with that. Or at well, least if, you know, it, it wasn't even so much about what he said. It was, and, and you touched on it earlier. It was the action he put behind it. Yeah. I saw what he said. And then I saw what he went out and what he was doing in the city of Philadelphia to make it better. Like right. he was actively working with kids. He was actively having conversations with um, police officers. Like he was out there trying to make a difference. He wasn't just sitting on a soapbox, spouting off, yeah. yelling, and not doing anything behind it. He was, he was doing things behind it. And I saw that because I'm from Philadelphia and I'm, you know, following actively what, what these Eagles players are doing, because, you know, again, you're in this position where um, you're, you're so in love with this team. Right. And yeah. I, and I have watched people in my family, like my, my dad grew up in West Philadelphia. Okay. He was one of 10 white kids in West Philadelphia growing up there in an Irish Catholic family. Mm. And um, he has his own experiences growing up. Right. And, and what he went through and, and, but he was always an Eagles fan, you know, right. the, 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 the Mannion Irish family was always Eagles fans. And 
Um, a lot of my family and friends who have followed this team, and, and I don't want to make it about the Eagles, but I think it's an important thing because as everything was happening, as the Eagles were going on this run and you saw this magic happening, there was this, you know, there was the kneeling going on and I'll just call yeah. it the kneeling for what it is. Yeah. And there were people that are close to me that could not get past that. They yeah. could not see the magic that was happening. They could not embrace this team and the beauty of what it was bringing to this city, a city that had longed for so many years for this championship because of, of some of the players kneeling. And they, they, it, was, it was just kind of crazy to watch how something, again, like you said, was it the right time for Colin Kaepernick to kneel? Well, he kneeled, and and we're and we're still talking still about talking it. In 2021. About it. I'm not, You're I'm not, not even in the yeah. NFL anymore. You know. Not, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying like some of the little things he's done that have pissed people off. They seem like, you know, every once in a while, people like leadership is hard, man. And I'm not questioning Collins. I'm not questioning Malcolm's. It is really hard for athletes to try to do this thing. So at times, they're going to be imperfection, that sort of thing. But you know that the people you're talking about in Philly that or elsewhere that are like, I just can't get down with it because of, you know, the demonstrating, I would ask them, do they know that like nobody really kneeled on the Eagles? Like Malcolm put his fist up, um, which I'm like, that's a, that's a show of solidarity. You're not, you're standing tall during the anthem and you're saying like, you know, like we're a part of America too. And, and we need to be, we need to be respected as such. And I agree with that. And, and so you know, the fact that I put my hand on his shoulder and got like really ridiculous messages told me everything I need to know about some people, not you, you know, not veterans who have served. And so, I mean, like you said, everybody's different. I, you know, like just because you're a veteran doesn't mean that I, I'm going to meet you and love you or that we're right. going to agree on stuff. Like I respect you, but it's the regular folks who didn't, haven't done shit for this country, don't really care and act like they, you know, that they're all, pa what's patriotism? I think that's the big question going yeah. forward. What is that? Well, and I also think again, you know, um, listen, I, I'm, I don't agree with everything that I've heard you say over the years. That's fine. Yeah, but, no, it's but, but, and you probably wouldn't agree with everything that, that I think or believe, yeah. but I know just talking to you right now, I could share those viewpoints with you and we could find common ground and understanding. And that's the biggest point or the problem we have in society. It's, I always think back to um, the song and I forget the name of the song, but it's, you know, um, jokers to the left of me or clowns to the left of me, jokers yes. to the right. Here I am stuck in the middle with you, okay. right? Like we're, we're like, there's the largest group of Americans are these people in the middle who may not agree on everything, but like we can find common ground. And there's just these loud voices on either side that can drown out actually doing good work and getting things accomplished. You know, the way I would put it is this, you know, <clears throat> I'm not a centrist, but we are in the middle as far as being, re you know, like being reasonable, right? right? I'm a liberal. Okay. I have, I have, I'm left of center. Like, you know, if you go up and down the, the chart, there'll be some things I'm closer to center on, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, hey, listen, I'm a gun owner. Okay. I like, I like hunting. I like shooting my guns. I like, but I'm also reasonable. Like, you know, is it like there, there's, there's all types of issues that like, I can see, I can see not both sides of it, but, um, I'm, I'm more reasonable than the people that you would expect to meet online. And I think, I think that's the biggest thing is that we have all these conversations online in arenas where we're being watched by our peers and we're afraid to lose our group status. Yep. And I'm not afraid to lose my group status. I am not a part of a group. I am. I, I, my ideologies are clear, but I don't need anybody. And I don't like the political system. I don't, I think it's, I think it's garbage. That's why in my opinion, we got what we got and you might, but like, I, I just think it's, I think it's a, I think the system screwed up. And I think people are too afraid to speak out against their own own ideological partners in crime. And I think we've gotten this like completely like torn apart country as a result, because all our, our conversations, they're not happening like this. I think everything comes down to trust. That's why a, a locker room is so it's so sacred, you know, like we can have conversations that we can't have in public. We can work issues out that we can't with, with the safety net of, I love that guy. 
I know that guy. I know he's a good person. So if if he's 15% different than me on something or, you know, 25% or we totally disagree on one issue, there's some that would disqualify for me. There's some friends that I've said, hey, see you later, dude. Like, you know, you're 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 full of it or you're you're I, I can't have you around me with that ideology. But for the most part, 99% of people, if they trust each other and they know that they're inherently good, they can work things out like across the table. We can't do that online. And that's why I've opted out. Like I've kind of opted out of having really tough discussions online. Um, Well, my friend, actually, I had him on the podcast. He's the uh, founder of Go Ruck um, and and Jason McCarthy. and, And we had actually a conversation around community. And one of the things he said is like, we as a society have mistaken social media for communities. It's not. They're not communities. Facebook and Instagram and Twitter are not communities. They are forums and they are bad places to think that you're going to find community. And, um, you know, and it's, it's kind of what is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big problem. It is, you know, I, I, I like to get back to the days of just, you know, posting pictures of your kids on their birthday and and it's gone. (laughs) Yeah. Those days are gone, but you know, that's, that's what I think the intent of social media was at the beginning to some degree. And, um, and it's gotten scary, but um, to get well, closer, like to keep, you know, like over the pandemic, that was huge yeah. to have like some, the internet and having like people that you can message or sure. FaceTime or, but the, the other stuff. And of course the George Floyd murder and all that stuff and all the, you know, the, the wounds that the scabs that were ripped off um, as a result, we picked the, well, there's no picking. Um, it was just the toughest time in history to do it because we were all apart and we were just arguing online. And, and I really do think that if more people trusted and loved each other and knew each other, that's why I think our society's biggest problem is, is, um, is segregation. And I know that people listening are like, well, the U S is not segregated. Well, look at our school systems in our neighborhoods. And I, I do believe that if people lived, lived among one another and worked among one another, like, and, and got to know each other better in this country, we'd be way better off and we would find common ground quicker, but our country's segregated still. I agree. If we came together, we would find common ground. I see that every day. And again, it's important to have those conversations. Um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to leave this conversation without talking about the work that you do do with veterans. So you touched on it briefly, but yeah. You you started the Chris Long Foundation, and that's how we became connected. You're in Philly. You, mm-hmm. You've done a couple dinners um, in in Philly where you've brought out some of our TMF uh, veterans, and they still talk about the the night they got to spend with you um, in Philadelphia. And so, beyond that, I want to talk about what you're doing and and talk about um, the the water projects that you do with uh, NFL players and veterans. Again, you touched on it a little yeah. bit, but I. I would love for uh, the audience to hear more about that work. Absolutely. The, the hallmark of the Chris Long Foundation is just um, is water work. I mean, we, we kind of fell into that. I went to Kilimanjaro in 2013 to climb a mountain because um, I just felt like doing it. And that was a little bit out of the, you know, out of the norm. It was outside the norm for an NFL player. And uh, I brought a teammate. We climbed it. We loved it. Uh, but. I just, when I'm traveling, I think about people, you know, like the places are beautiful, but like, um, the people I met really blew me away. I just, I I came away with it thinking life is so much different here. Anybody has traveled and the reason veterans are going to come into play is because they know that better than anybody. Life is different other places. You know, we have our problems that we need to work out. We've talked about them at length, but the basic necessities of living are, more scarce in a place like Tanzania. And I just wanted to help and be a good traveler. I love the experience. I met beautiful, stoic, um, amazing people. And the second word I used stoic was the one that really stood out to me. You know, I, I wish I didn't have to respect uh, people for being stoic because I'd rather them not have to be, but I just really admired and was blown away by, you know, the mothers that have to walk you know, six, seven miles to get water to keep their kids um, hydrated. Um, 
at the risk of most likely the water being brown and undrinkable and you know you're playing with fire but what choice do you have um farmers struggling to you know keep their crops alive you know kids who can't spend time in school because um they have waterborne illness which eventually kills in east africa and places like that as you know so um when i was leaving i was well it was the night before i left me and james hall the teammate i went with we're drinking a couple of tanzanian ipas and so when you get down from the mountain you're pretty dehydrated so we were we were pretty tipsy pretty quick and i thought i heard my name in the bar and i'm like there's no way somebody just walking in the bar and knows my name we're in tanzania i turn around it's joe buck and joe buck is there with right and if you know joe buck if you walk watch baseball or football he's um he works for Fox and he's worked with my dad for many years. And I got to know him in St. Louis because that's where I got drafted. When I got there, he's the first guy who took me out to dinner. Joe Buck's a great guy. And I was like, what the hell are you doing here? After we got over the like, we're halfway around the world thing, he explained to me that he's there on a water project um, with a guy named uh, Doug Pitt. Um, and Doug Pitt is the Goodwill Ambassador of Tanzania. And they were like, you want to go tomorrow? And I was like, oh, my flight kind of like, uh, be, like, you know, I wasn't that like, I wish I could sell this as I had some big epiphany and I was just right. in it to win it from the beginning, but I'm a, I'm a pragmatist and um, I want to help in an area that we know we're going to get a return on our investment, that we're going to, we're going to improve the world quickly. And it wasn't my heart. It was my brain. You know, when I left, I was thinking about what he said and all those things that I mentioned about the stoicism of people that live there in so many ways, not just water, it illuminated something to me. And that was that we don't have this cause in pro football to rally behind. And this is a perfect way that I can help here, but it's also a way that I think that we can shed light on one of the world's biggest problems. And that's water scarcity. It's waterborne illness. Um, you know, it's, it's in East Africa, you know, you're talking about very rarely do you have a uh, safe predictable source of water and uh and i said how can we help and we thought up the name water boys and we we employed a bunch of guys around the league to try to help because i you know if there's one advice if there's any advice i have to anybody doing anything it's know your your weaknesses and know your limitations and and um i knew my weakness might have been a little bit of like national name recognition like i was one of the i was one of the best better dns in the league at this point in my career i was in my prime you know but I wasn't a household name. I'm not like a superstar. I play in St. Louis, not the big market. So we need those guys from big markets. So we gathered everybody together and we started, you know, I cold called a bunch of guys. I got a bunch of no's. I had stupid ideas. They didn't work out, but like five, seven years down the road, we shattered our goal of 32 wells for 32 teams. Um, we have, we have eclipsed the hundred well mark. We are halfway to our goal of a million people served. And we did it on the backs of a lot of really generous donors who were giving one, three, five dollars. You know, so I'm very proud of NFL fans for getting behind this because it is an outside the box problem for Americans. Yeah. Unless you live in Flint or unless you live in many rural communities, which we've started to work in here with our domestic work uh, for hometown H2O. I mean, we're putting in wells in Texas and Virginia and I mean, hopefully Alabama and you all types of places. too, you know, we do a it, lot of humanitarian work and we, we take uh, families of the fallen on, on expeditions across the yeah. world. And so I've been to Guatemala and uh, I just got back from Puerto Rico a little over a year ago. And, you know, but, but then we also go into West Virginia and, and some of the families that we work with has said, like, we've gone around the world with you, but when we go to West Virginia, you just can't believe that people four hours away from where you're living are, are living in the situations that they are. So Quite yeah. literally. And so it was illuminating to me, educational for me, because for many years as we were, we were doing these wells, which are all large solar powered wells, they serve up to 7,500 people. There are millions of inoperable uh, hand pumps around the world. I'm not saying it's not a good thing to do a hand pump well, but we want to we want to bring these folks the Cadillac of of uh, you know solar systems that are going to be around for a while. They're predictable, and our partners train people on the ground and how to you know be self sufficient, how to improve the agricultural situation in their villages, how to you know we've worked in schools, we've we've done pumps there, but there were always people saying, "What are you doing here?" and "What about Flint?" I think no, number one, the Flint thing, 
totally different situation. You can't just slap a 7,500 uh, person well in downtown Flint. That's not how it works. We have bureaucratic issues there. You know, and the government's still throwing money at it and they need to throw more money at it. They need to fix it, okay? West Virginia, those places, Texas, rural communities, those are the people that are getting left behind and those are the people that we can scale to help. I can't help Flint. I can't. We've done a Red Cross thing where we pitched in and tried to get matching funds from fans and nobody did anything. And those are the same people that were saying, what are you doing for Flint? People are just always going to have a problem with what you're doing. But we're balancing the international work with that domestic element. And we're also working on Navajo Nation, because if you're an indigenous person, you have 17 times the chance of encountering a water crisis in this country than we do. And if you're a person of color, it's two and a half times more. So like we're we're trying to grease the squeaky wheel. We're trying to be here. We're trying to be there. We also just started Water for Her which is a women's initiative, because as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the majority of the water gathering responsibility, which is often dangerous, unspeakably dangerous, and you know not that productive, falls on the shoulders of women and girls in Sub-Saharan Africa. So Water for Her is awesome. We launched it. But my favorite thing, honestly, I would, I would say this on another podcast too. It's not just because I'm talking to a bunch of vets. Uh, it's it's the conquering Killy thing that I started with Nate Boyer, who's Green Beret. Um, and I can remember vividly cold calling Nate after I saw an ESPN feature about him, which is another thing. It's like when you're a philanthropist for many years at the beginning of my career, I shunned attention because I didn't want to be the guy that was doing it for attention. It still makes my skin crawl to get attention for some of this stuff. The Walter Payton Man of the Year thing, I couldn't be prouder it still, it still makes my skin crawl because I don't think I deserve it. You know what I mean? And it, Nate going on ESPN, though, again, you have to leverage your platform. Yeah. You know, if Nate doesn't go on ESPN, I don't know he's, I don't know his story. Right. I don't know the, you know, I don't know the work that he's intending to do or has done in the past. And when I heard that he's worked in places that we've worked and I heard his story and we seem like we had some things in common other than him being a badass and like two feet shorter than me, he, <laughs> He, he just seemed like a go-getter and he cared about people. And so I called him through Jay Glazer and I said, listen, man, I don't know you. I just think you can help us. You tell me how you want to help us. And he said, um, because we were trying to get veterans involved at this point, we'd always work with veterans. It was important to me. He said, listen, you climb that mountain. Why don't we bring some vets over to climb it? And I said, hell yeah, let's do it. Does that mean I got to climb it every year? <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how it's gone. I mean, Nate and uh, another guy climbed the first year because I couldn't. Um, and then the second year, we had eight, 10 guys. And we've brought numerous vets. We had Kirstie Ennis, who was a helicopter gunner, lost yep. her leg. And she's the first female above the knee amputee to ever summit Kelly. I'm proud to say I was right behind her. That's and, awesome. you know, Elliot Ruiz, who's a Philly guy. Um, I didn't cry, I said, during the New England Super Bowl. Two weeks later, when we were at the top of that mountain, I was bawling like a baby. You know, hearing Elliot Ruiz say something like, I'm not supposed to be here, which is bullshit. You are. I still get chills thinking about that. Yeah. You know, and I still get chills thinking about Nick Hardwick and Luis Castillo, two guys who played for the Chargers, leading Ivan up a mountain. And Ivan's completely blind. And Fred, uh, Freddie Dumar, who's uh, a, a Green Beret, it's his best friend brought him up the mountain. Fred keels over and starts puking blood. He's an ultra marathoner. He's puking blood at 17,000 feet in the dead of night. And he has to go back down and he tells Luis and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, Nick, you got him. And of course he's like, yeah, we got him. And then Fred who you got him means something different to y'all. He's like, no, you got him. And I still think about that. And I think about watching those guys arm in arm saying rock on the left, left foot, right foot on the side of a sheer cliff that falls like 500 yards. And, and just the sheer responsibility of going together. And um, it, it moves me every time. And when I tell you that sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get athletes to help with, with a cause, uh, it's like pulling teeth to get my veteran friends to stop calling me to help. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and 
when it, when I talk about like why they're the MVPs of our of our initiative, it's because they they know service. Like that's just what you got you guys listening or you know some of my friends know. It's just helping people. And they've helped me. They've helped guys that have played and and gone up the mountain with them. And most importantly, they've helped the people that are there in East Africa. When Elliot Ruiz bent over this creek outside this um outside this school that we were working on and and Elliot knows this he's told all these stories so I'm not outing him but he started crying again <laughs> he's the most badass dude in the world but he's crying again because he's looking at this creek that these kids are getting water from down a hill and there's gasoline film and trash in it and that's what these kids are thoughtlessly filling up their jugs and going and drinking every day and so when you see a guy who's seen everything and that affects him it's further validation that we need to do something and so we have a retreat or a, a reunion every year on my farm where all those guys and girls, uh, you know, are invited and athletes too. And we just have a great time. We got lifelong friendships because of it. So selfishly, I love it um, because I've made so many great friends. Um, but I also love it for what we do because they're our biggest earth movers. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's... Uh... I love what you do and so completely aligns with everything we do at the Travis Manning Foundation. You know, uh, we always say that, you know, our biggest civic assets we have as, as a country are our nation's veterans. And they don't just come home and lose that desire to serve. Um, in fact, you know, most of them are more than willing to continue serving and need that to thrive as individuals. Like they can't walk away from that life of service. So that's what we do at TMF every day is provide them those opportunities. I mean, we're you, not a group. Guys, we say yeah, we you need guys you. Do great work. Yeah, we need you. And, um, and you know, I love that you're, you're continuing to empower our veteran community in that way to join alongside. It's, it's awesome stuff. I love seeing it. I'd love to send one of our, uh, our veterans with you. Um, oh, we'd love right? that. Yeah. We'd love that. And I do want to say one thing, the thing that like, you know, it's delicate because I, you know, I've thought it and there is some intention in forming these groups, but I can't you you never want to say it out loud because some people don't know if you're stupid or not. But like there is a commonality in one way when it comes to I hate the like the war in football or the the, the you know, military life and football. But I've let the veterans tell me this and it's confirmed my suspicion. Mm -hmm. A lot of those guys and girls want to be a part of something. Like they were a part of something that was bigger than themselves for a long time. And guess what? It's not there anymore. And, um, you know, I, I'm proud to provide, even if it's a little thing that we can do that we're not as big as like, I'm very proud. That's one thing I'm proud of is seeing the groups together. And that includes the football players who it's well-documented. We struggle existentially when you get done and money doesn't fix that. And the whole thing doesn't fix that. Just like being a badass and being proud of what you've done for your country doesn't fix that for all veterans. We need each other just like y'all need each other. And I think it's just like to see the groups together in a tent, 16,000 feet up a mountain, tired as hell, haven't showered in a week, but it's like we're sitting in our locker room or y'all's mess, mess tent. And it's, it's just the same thing. We're, when we get together, it's like we all know each other. Y'all are way more badass and have actually risked way more than us. But the group element of like, it's just that kind of group love where oh. we, we just, you know, it's, we yeah, miss that. Definitely. I mean, I, I completely agree with that. I think, you know, you, you look at athletes, they lose their sense of identity when they, yeah. they, they retire. Um, it's like, well, what do I do now? And that's what veterans deal with. You know, they, they take off that uniform and it's like, well, what comes next? Like yeah. this being a service member defined me as a person. Like, and now I need to figure out what comes next. So uh, love that you are continuing to give that opportunity for some veterans to find what comes next for them. Um, Chris, this has been awesome. I want to leave you with the okay. last question that I ask everybody on the Resilient Life podcast. And that is, what does living a resilient life look like for you? Whew. I don't even think about being resilient. And I'm not saying this proudly. I'm sure at one point I wasn't, but. I think um, you to become resilient, you have to go through experiences. You have to you have to seek them. You have to seek getting your ass kicked. You have to seek losing. You have to seek failing. And I just 
I didn't seek it because uh, I intended on, you know, winning every game I played in or, you know, never getting hurt, never getting cut. Um, you know, the pressure, I didn't seek that stuff, but that stuff made me better. And so um, everybody's got their own challenges. You don't have to be a pro football player or a veteran to be resilient. And I think it's just like taking pride in, and I'm pointing, you know, to my head here, my temple, I think that's where my brain is. What's here? Like, what do you have between your ears? And, you know, um, brave people, they're not unafraid. They're just, bra- they, they overcome that fear. And, and, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the way you can do that is to lose and, and go out and seek experiences that are not going to be easy for you. And I also think you have to have motivations outside yourself. Like what allows me to be resilient is my kids at this stage of my life. If I'm ever going through something like it's, it's unfathomable that I would give up and tell my kids that I'm giving up at something, you know what I mean? And so your motivations are going to change through life. But the one, one thing that should always be um, a common thread should be, you should be doing things that are bigger than yourself and you should be getting your ass kicked sometimes. And I've got my ass kicked plenty. So I love that. And you know, you worried don't, about it. You don't grow if you don't lose sometimes. And yep. you know, I think that's, that's so true and finding motivation. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I've got three kids. They are my motivation that I will not, I will not stop going because of them, but each and every one of us can find our own motivation in life. And it's something outside of us, something that's bigger than us, uh, that helps us to keep moving forward through adversity and through things that are going to inevitably hit us each and every one of us. Um, so Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really awesome conversation. I'm excited for everybody to hear it. Uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Resilient Life Podcast. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. Thanks so much for having me.